Hello and welcome to the Source One podcast. Consider us your source for the latest procurement, supply management, and strategic sourcing insights, anytime, anywhere. How did you get your start in supply chain management, and what did the industry look like back in those days? Uh, good question. I really never intended to be in supply chain management. Let me, let me be right up front about that. I grew up in the old telephone company days, what we now know as Verizon. I had fully intended to go to work for the telephone company and receive a gold watch. It's a long story, but I was tapped on the shoulder to move into uh, purchasing at the time and to listen to what was going on with regard to this whole new idea of procurement and sourcing. I had a wonderful mentor, a fellow by the name of Dr. Helmut Porker. Helmut was really the person who gave me my start. So that was the introduction to it. What did the industry look like at the, uh, back in those days, if we're really thinking about it? It was just basically purchasing. This whole concept of sourcing was coming forward. And our company knew that it could be doing better. And we did what was called a broad paper exercise, where a consulting firm by the name of CSC went out and visited all of our locations with a big roll of brown paper and had them put post-it notes on us to tell us what we were doing right and doing wrong. And uh, we found out that, unfortunately, we were doing more wrong than right. We made a commitment to change things. And uh, that's how I really found myself in the management. So that's a very long-winded answer to a short question. Well, no, no, there's definitely a story to be told, and that's sort of uh, in keeping with your contribution to the White Paper Series, uh, Procurement Transformation Industry Perspective. So one of the things you talk about throughout is the different transformations that the term procurement transformation has undergone over the years. When did you first come across the term, and what were people's responses to the term back then, and how has our definition of it changed over the years? That's a very deep question. As far as when I was first introduced to the term, it was when I had already gone through a transformation. We just didn't call it that. That was with my Mobe buyer days. We we went through all the steps that one takes to transform a purchasing organization to become a true uh, procurement organization under the direction of a CPO. But again, that is not what we called it. We took a series of steps, made a series of changes, but in fairness, we always had a long-term view, and I think that's what people miss, is the term transformation speaks to looking out into the future, uh, continually looking out into the future. It's not a change for, for the sake of change. I was first introduced to the term working for a CPO that we brought into Bear. His name was Robert Unsky. He had come from Bethlehem Steel. And the reason he was calling it a transformation is, is he wanted to make it clear that he recognized that we had been through one significant change. But to his credit, he had the firm belief that one should always be transformed. You really shouldn't stand still. It's not an event. It's an ongoing process. When I would speak with other procurement organizations, they didn't necessarily recognize as much as to what transformation really was. We were now using this new term, transformation. People were still going through changes to their procurement organizations or build-ups or reorgs or redesigns. So there were a lot of terms coined. As far as how the definition has changed over time, beyond what I just shared with you, it really comes down to I think the term is misappropriated, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. People don't look at the big picture. The big picture of transformation comes down to that golden triangle, people, process, and technology. And generally, when I'm working with a client or working with someone like Source One, and they're working with the client and I'm supporting them, what we hear is, well, we'll bring in the technology and that'll transform us. We'll make a redesign to our org and that'll transform us. 
and I do find it, uh, let me say, disquieting that folks look at transformation and only look at one component, and they're confusing change with transformation because realistically, realistically, transformation should be an ongoing process. It, it shouldn't just be... Uh, in your contribution to the white paper, you mentioned a few kind of key publications in the history of supply management and procurement transformation. Are there other essential books and articles you'd mentioned from the last three and a half decades of supply management? Hmm. Well, it's a big question, the, potentially. Uh, the Krelchik article is the go-to article, and the Cotter piece is on change. And there, he has a number of great books out there on on change that really just tries to to crystallize this concept of change management and all the communication and all the effort that goes with it. But Connor really does point out very succinctly, and he's not bashful about it, that basically about 70% of transformations fail, and that's because people really cannot articulate what a transformation is. Now, I looked at that question and said, okay, what's really relevant? What should people know uh, what books should they read that will help them in the grand scheme of things with regard to transformation? And while none of what I'm about to share with you is transformation specific, these are all books that if you read them and understand them, really help you. And by the way, I keep a, on my back shelf 20 books. It's limited to 20 books, and those are my go-to books on this topic of transformation. And uh, if something really new and great comes out, I pull one of the books out and replace it with the new and great. But let me offer this to you. There's a lot of churn in the industry right now with professionals, and that was called to attention several years ago, well, probably more than a decade ago, by a couple by the name of Leonard and Swap in a book called Deep Smarts, and they articulated at the time that people really need to recognize that where we are right now in intergenerational differences with the exodus of, and I'm going to use the term baby boomers right now, with the exodus of the baby boomers, there needs to be a whole lot of thought that goes into how do you retain the institutional knowledge within your company. That's a very important part of transformation. Obviously, leadership comes into play, and my go-to book on leadership is uh, Kuzis and Posnor, The Leadership Challenge. That book tells you quite a bit. That really does help in solidifying thinking for a leader who makes the determination that she or he is going to take on a transformation. Um, teamwork becomes another part of that, and really do like the book by Lencioni, Patrick Lencioni, called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And that's because when you're going into a transformation, there has to be a whole lot of teamwork. And that's a very simple read, a very good read. And then I'm a big fan of a book that I really pushed off on called The Speed of Trust. It's by Stephen M. R. Covey. He is the son of the, the Covey that we know for the seven habits of highly effective people. And in the speed of trust, which I thought, oh my goodness, another book on trust, just what I need to read. And the reason I call out this book is because if you cannot communicate, if you cannot establish trust within an organization, not transform the organization. And that trust starts at the core, the folks who are initiating that transformation. In our case, the supply management group. The people that are touched by that transformation, and the internal clients, the internal stakeholders. And then the external folks, and that includes the suppliers. It's just not the shareholders or the rate payers if you're in the public sector. It's the suppliers who are influenced by the transformation as well. So maybe a little bit of a curve on the answer um, based upon the question. But I hope you can understand where I'm coming from as to why I believe these books are important. Yeah, yeah, no, certainly. Uh, it's, it's certainly each of them kind of 
speaks to a specific component that's necessary for you know getting a transformation going. Obviously, your contribution charts the evolution of the procurement function itself from the days when it was just purchasing to now. In that time, what has surprised you most about the strategic evolution that we've seen? What has surprised me most is the left behind factor. And let me expand on that, please. The, the attention goes to the top 20% of the companies that are probably handling about 80% of the spend. Uh, and there are very large companies out there in industry that are doing absolutely wonderful things from manufacturing to services companies to technology companies to healthcare. They're doing great things with the whole concept of supply management, the whole concept of procurement. But the reason I said the left behind factor is because there is this very, very large group of entities out there that are trying to establish a foothold with procurement. They're having a hard time leading the concept. They're having a hard time wrapping their head around it. They are key candidates for transformation. I know that sounds like a sales pitch, but I see enough of this on a day-to-day -day basis to say that that 80% of the companies handling the remaining 20% of spend in the grand scheme are those companies that really, really need help. Those companies that are just trying to understand what transformation means are actually prime candidates to embrace the concepts that have evolved and grown over the past three decades. And it's so much easier today to do things than it was way back when. When it came to strategic sourcing back then, we had none of the tools, none of the tools that exist today. We, we didn't have the internet, although it was evolving. We didn't have all the information. We didn't have the spend detail, as was pointed out in the article. We didn't have these organizational prototypes that were out there that we could fall back on and look at from the standpoint of who plays what role within the organization. That now exists, and it's further reinforced by the fact that we have across the country here in the, in the United States, as well as across the world, a whole new generation of people coming into the workforce who have been introduced to these concepts in the academic environment but they're looking for the opportunity to act on all the wonderful things that they have learned while they have been trained. So what I find most surprising is this wealth of opportunity, this wealth of information, with this wealth of experience, still having problems with procurement transformation, and we're still having problems with the general concept. I sometimes think that people find it very intimidating. Uh, in your opinion, what, what what's next? What will procurement and procurement transformation look like in another 35 years? Well, we just spoke of all the, the concepts and, and all the capabilities and the process and the people and the technology. Those have evolved significantly over the last three decades. And they will continue to evolve. I just hope people recognize that those those three circles come together to make that great Venn diagram with procurement transformation in the overlap area. Um, I just, I, I, I'm genuinely concerned that people will look at either the technology or the fact that I have this whole group of emerging professionals that are coming into my organization, so I've transformed it by bringing in a lot of new and very capable talent. I'm hoping that people just don't become fixated on one of those components. However, having said that, if we can collaborate, if we can draw from the deep smarts that I had referenced very early on, in this discussion, if we can draw from those deep smarts and 
pass along the institutional knowledge, to pass along all awareness within an organization to the emerging generation of, of supply management professionals that are coming in. That's the best of all worlds. So that's that basically where we're headed here probably in the next five to ten years. The key then becomes procurement has to reinforce its value within the organization. Quite frankly, it has to do a better job of branding to ensure that the internal clients and the, the, most importantly the senior management team sees the value of continually transforming a procurement organization so that it evolves over time. It can help with new product development. It can help meet supply chain risks. It can help in so many different areas. But that really comes down to collaboration and a confidence in the organization. And I think we've developed some of that. I just don't believe that we've developed enough of that over the last three decades. I am optimistic about the future of supply management. I am optimistic about continued procurement transformation. I'm very optimistic that somewhere out there on the near horizon is something that, that's going to help us one more time revolutionize supply management, much like Peter Kralchik did with his article way back in 83. Well, Jim, thank you so much for agreeing to supplement your contribution with the conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you and Source One and the entire team for the invitation to participate. You can tell I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the topic. You've been listening to the Source One podcast. For more strategic sourcing and procurement insights every day, visit our blog, The Strategic Sorcerer. Want to provide feedback or suggest a topic for a future episode? Let us know at prrequest at sourceoneinc.com. Thanks for listening.